the speaker, Gaetano Alber uh, Albergo from the University of Catania. And uh, the title of the talk is uh, The First Person Perspective uh, Requirement in Defense. Thank you. So, according to Professor Becker, to have a robust first person perspective, one must be able to manifest it. Well, so, uh, how can a child manifest her first person, first person perspective? According to Joseph Perlman, at the age of three, children possess a concept, relief or pretense, in which the concepts of pretend and belief coexist and differentiated. The concept of the relief allows the child to understand that a person can act as if, as if something was such and such, for example, as if this banana is a telephone, when it is not. At the age of four, they understand that, like the public representations, inner representations can also misrepresent states of affairs. This hypothesis lends itself to several criticism. The idea of an early lack of a distinction between a pretense and false belief contains a confusion between ascription in the first or third person. For example, a first element that demonstrates the plausibility of the argument of the indistinction is to recognize that engaging in pretense involves a certain degree of awareness that one has to deal with a non-real situation. Professor Becker has made a plea for the definition of the relationship between awareness and first-person perspective. Moreover, as noted by John Searle, one cannot truly be said to have pretended to do something unless one intended to pretend to do it. The first person access to the counterfactuality of a situation, self-produced, is different from access to the incorrect representation of a situation. Without the knowledge that, in cases of pretense, we have to do with a non-real situation, the activity itself would be impossible, because we could not distinguish it from the case of error or confusion. Perner could argue against such arguments of qualitative kind, insisting that the state of a relief is characterized by the inability to distinguish between pretense and belief just because in both cases, there would be a common form of our awareness of act as if. A demonstration of the fact that the qualitative arguments do not care with them every ever is a solution, it would not be difficult to even strengthen Perna's argument if we could put into question the salience of phenomenology of pretense. And I think support in this uh, uh, direction apparently is offered to us only indirectly by those authors as uh, Peter Carruthers, Stephen Stich, uh, Sean Nichols, and many others for which the phenomenon of a pretense would be closely related to the act of supposing. An old thesis of Christopher Pico seems to support the issue by introducing the idea of a clear distinction between imagination and supposition on the basis of a presumed rich phenomenology pertaining only to the states of imagination. Then it would be useless to ask the question, what is it like to pretend that if once you accept the first thesis on the relationship between pretense and supposition, we decided to trust the thesis of Pico on phenomenological poverty in the act of supposing. But we are not forced to accept this uh, consequences clearly looking counterintuitive given that Pico's, Pico's argument turn, turns out to be not very convincing, I think. We can easily imagine moments of a process of imagination where it is not present in any particular phenomenology. For example, when reading a fantastic long story as um, a reporter, not, uh, I think uh, there not every imagined sentence will be accompanied by a particular phenomenology. And, on the other hand, if we deny that who supposes something is not in a certain state different from supposing itself, 
we would have uh, cases that could stand only on the condition to exclude that processes of participation may occur during the process of supposition. But even this idea is easily rejected by the numerous counterexamples that it would be possible to trace. For example, uh, Weinberg and Maskin uh, require us, ask us to assume that there is a house very similar to ours, but a reverse it in the mirror from left to right. So, the difficulties that emerge from the analysis of the qualitative aspects, therefore, led us to conclude that, with regard to the question of the distinction between error and pretense, it is correct to use the subject of a consciousness only if justified by an independent account, maybe of conceptual kind. And you need not to go far to find it. As will be demonstrated shortly, it will be sufficient to focus the analysis on the first person optics. While acting in a wrong way, the subject intentionally takes that P is true in the pretense scenario, who acts intentionally assumes that the P is false. Note that the above is not incompatible with the theory of Perma. In both cases, in fact, we will expect that the two subjects operate in a roughly similar manner. Both would be willing to make a number of inferences from P and behave accordingly. Their behavior can still be described in terms of act as if. But as our account will light to continue along the perspective of a parallel would result in the inability to assign a capacity sufficient to distinguish a reality from fiction. In other words, it would be it would not be unusual to see children intent on making a real phone call with a banana. These are famous uh, words by Jerry Ford. You can, however, try to separate pretense and error in a conceptual manner by using the same basic assumption. So for sure. Kellner and Barnes told us in Chomsky's terms that uh, we can determine how languages and the conceptual systems are constrained by examining the forms and meanings that children construct and which errors they fail to make. I think we can do the same with the, the activity of pretense. We can try to adapt to our proposals an example of Piaget where he tells us that he had observed her daughter Jacqueline <coughs> pretending that a piece of cloth were a round pillow. Let us assume that the girl is wrong. Imagine that the child has exchanged that piece of cloth for a pillow. Therefore, we could think that for Jacqueline, it's true that the object in her hand is a pillow. But how do we decide if we are faced with a case of error, false beliefs, or a more general situation of act as if? The argument of consciousness, as it stands, just suggests that this is not a case of pretense because from the perspective of the agent there are not the typical features of a case of pretense. This, however, is not a sufficient argument for the distinction between error and pretense, uh, or at least not a reason to recognize an autonomous nature of the error cases. After all, between the necessary features to recognize a case of pretense, there is a sufficient one to identify it with the cases of error, that is, acting as if. In front of a case of error, it will always be possible to confuse it with a case of pretense by virtue of their common features. Indeed, our argument will allow us to avoid these unpleasant consequences. Returning to our example with Jacqueline, once it is recognized that the child is acting wrongly, assuming it's true that this object, the piece of cloth, is a pillow, then we can, uh, we can also ask what immediately following scenarios are possible and which are contradictory with respect to the content of our proposition. Acting, assuming that P2 involves recognizing a rational minimum of possible states of affairs that do not contradict the initial premise. But with a child under three years of age, this space of a contradiction does not coincide with the class of all behaviors that would make P false. For example, the being true of P is compatible with taking as false all the true propositions about the proper function of a component element of the propositional content of P. 
for example, the studies inaugurated by Donna Winnicott on uh, transition objects show us that a child can interact intentionally with a wide range of objects, not just artifacts, in a manner inconsistent with their true function, even when she's already able to use them properly. For example, a doll may be subject both to the most careful attentions and the most destructive instincts. She may love a particular blanket just because she likes to use the margin of it to caress her face, for example. In the case of the pillow, she may want to panel it to walk on it as a carpet. She can carry it around like the Linus always brings within its cover. She can even use a margin as a substitute for thumb sucking. And maybe she can have fun knocking it against the others in a pajama party to bring out its feathers. In the example above, actions have all originated from taking as true the contents of the initial proposition entertained by Jacqueline. But if, as the examples show, our proposition P is always true in spite of the possible in the inductive extensions, not all inductions will be accepted in the same way. You can, in fact, preserve the true value of P inscribing the compositionality of its sense in the counterfactual space, at least in respect of certain aspects of functional level. We cannot say the same for the kind of situation, propositions, where a issue is the ontological substratum of a certain substance. substance sorry. A physical object would be provided with extension in space, solidity, material, composition, etc. A member of the class people has a certain posture for every occasion, will bleed if injury breathe as always a mother. From the point of view of cognition, stability of a certain structure is a distal category. The development of the knowledge of reality may use tools sensitive to contradictions, but this would be impossible without awareness and intentionality. But I think it also depends on basic inductive generalizations at the non-conceptual level. Well, let's try to better understand what kind of induction children use in pretense. It has been argued that uh, pretending to hear holds understand four features of pretense. Pretend stipulation, causal powers, the suspension of objective truth, and an unfolding causal chain. The current situation might contain a toy horse or an empty cup. Then, for example, memory systems are addressed, returning information on entities that, that are perceptually similar, for example, on uh, horses, or on the functional properties of the object, for example, on containing. This leads to, this leads to pretense based on perceptual assimilarity, perceptual similarity, or on functional connection. To address the functional side of objects is important, also because traditional psychology investigating, investigating categorization has denied the important role that quine gave to the sense of similarity in the process. Pretense involved normative aspects. That is, what is appropriate, what is a mistake, or highly inappropriate in a given context. For example, Rakozzi and Tomazello uh, have shown that the children from around two years old not only are proficient at uh, acting according to jointly set up fiction stipulation in the context of shared pretend play, but when a third party confused pretense identities and thus made the mistakes, children, little at protest and critic. I think we can recognize that in our example, in our examples of pretense, there is something that can be called a conic. The conic device might possess certain elementary conic markers and sometimes a minimal resemblance is due to the fact that the conic sign, even though different in shape from its soft, its soft object, performs the same function. We can think just a stick which qualifies as a horse because one can proudly ride it. The only aspect that the stick has in common with a real horse is that it can be straddled. 
hence the child has rendered emergent one of the functions permitted by the course. Now, contrary to what is sometimes said, communication need not come into this process at all. He may not have wanted to show his horse to anyone. It just served as a focus for his fantasies as he galloped along. Here I agree with the Hearst Cambridge. Second point about self-consciousness. I think that Professor Becker, Professor Becker's insistence on the inescapable role of language goes beyond what is justified by facts. Hardly pretense is just an example of this problem. For example, these are some examples by uh, Mr. Bermuda, um, some evidence for uh, a primitive self-awareness in child, uh, very, very early. For example, uh, according to Jose Bermuda in his book, uh, The Paradox of Self-Consciousness, when we say that uh, without language, there would be no self-consciousness, we meet two circularity. The first, the ability to entertain conscious thought, a conscious thought. This precedes the context with the pronoun I, while the hypothesis of language first makes the ability to entertain I thoughts dependent on the linguistic competence. And this is the second the circularity, the circular dependency of the two abilities makes it difficult to explain also how we can become self-conscious. So, if each of the two capacities presuppose the other one, what will learn first? To entertain I thoughts or to use I sentences? For Bermuda, there are only kinds of non-conceptual self-consciousness, something akin to self-recognition. This forms of thought would not be based on any linguistic mediation. If the thought may be non-linguistic, then even self-consciousness can be non-conceptual. Thus, the competence in the pronoun I is far from being regarded as a prerequisite of self-conscious self -conscious thought. Widow Bermuda adopts Peacock's idea that there are non-conceptual contents that are non-representational in nature. I think, for example, the function of objects may be a good example of this kind of content, the function that child used to uh, project uh, their, their fantasies in a pre-template. So, these are other examples by Bermuda. I would add that it's not obvious that if we have an explanation of how we can entertain our thoughts, then we would have explained everything there is to explain. What would remain to be explained is the phenomenal side of self-consciousness that is not reducible to the introspective accessibility to information. It is necessary to distinguish between the phenomenal aspects and the cognitive one of self-awareness. Having the ability to refer to myself, to refer to myself in my own mental states and being aware of them belongs to the cognitive aspect of self. The feeling of being yourself is instead something that has to do with the phenomenal aspects of the matter. Explain how, how do we get it, sorry, explain how do we get I thoughts is a psychological shoe, but it leaves out the phenomenology linked to them. I think that between the simple consciousness and the self-consciousness would be appropriate to recognize intermediate states to avoid reducing the first the simple ability to intentionally generate representation and orient attention in a more or less conscious way to a stimulus, so making self-consciousness a function of language with the consequence of not attributing self-consciousness to people suffering from speech disorders such as uh, aphasia. Consciousness is not just a matter of ability to discriminate environmental stimuli but is also a matter of being aware of this and feeling something while being in this state of awareness. I get to conclusion. I think pretense, I think between pretense and development of empirical concepts, 
the same used by Professor Becker to explain the development of self-consciousness, we can find a common basic ability, that is the ability to, to observe, the ability of uh, observation. The studies on observational learning have focused on the non-modular processes relating particularly to the ability to recall and categorization, activities where the attention and the state of the consciousness during the analysis of the patterns wouldn't be negotiable conditions. In general, in the context of the recent literature on the metaphysics of intentionality, we may notice a wide split between authors supporting the Kant, uh, what Kant called the receptivity, no? and others who, in uh, describing the perceptual judgment based on observation, would not be willing to abandon the Kantian spontaneity. So, the essential requirement of every empiricist program concerning knowledge, that is the disposition to respond differently to different uh, environmental stimuli, the so-called ability to discriminate, it is considered only a necessary but not sufficient condition by those authors such as Brandon and the sellers, who instead attribute to the language the main role in the formation of cognitive epistemic states, because they would be conceptual and inferentially articulated. These two, ability to discriminate and conceptual understanding, a process that Brandon calls totally account, would be inseparable in any claim of observational knowledge. In front of a proximal stimulus, every answer uh, without any inferential meaning, even if only potential, would be cognitively empty. As a result, there would be no form of reasoning independent of the ability to give and ask for reasons. That is the void of the inferential capacity and consciousness which accompanies it. So, we can reconsider our concept of observation questioning two points. First one, is the observer's response contentful just insofar as it occupies uh, a node in a web of uh, differential relations? And second one, does a differential responsive disposition to respond to environing stimuli need a social knowledge man because the normative status of committing oneself would be, according to Brandon's view, a social status? Well, I think pretense, um, pretense can be a possible answer against this uh, kind of solution, mm, based on the model of uh, all or nothing. Thank you. minutes for the discussion so, <clears throat> yes professor Baker thank you I'm afraid I'm afraid I couldn't actually read your hand if you're on um, uh, the slides because I just I have bad eyes I could have yours too <laughs> and now well, here's what I thought you said I thought early on you so there was a question of distinguishing pretense from error. Uh, and that, that just reminded me when I was a very young child, about four years before, and I think this is very common, I had a, imaginary playmates. In fact, I had four, Toto, PP, Cusapi, and Mickey. Um, but I don't know how I individuated them or anything, but that's beside the point. Um, but, but when I would talk, I would talk to my mother about these my imaginary playmates, and she would even invite them to dinner, but only one at a time. <laughs> but but my, my, I guess the point I wanted, or the suggestion I wanted to make was, I don't think I ever, ever was an error about, about them. They were my imaginary playmates. I don't know if I knew they were imaginary, but my made-up playmates. They weren't real. That's the difference between reality and pretense, I mean, uh, uh, error and pretense, it seems to me. That in pretense, you're not under any illusions about what's going on in reality. But in error, you are under a, you're mistaken about something in reality. But in pretense, you're not mistaken about anything in reality. Did I just miss your point? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's very near to the, the point that uh, I'm, I'm talking about. Um, just yes. Um, I think. Uh, uh, those who keep to stress the, different, the difference between imagination and uh, explicit behavior, 
um, emphasize uh, emphasize more transparency uh, for the mental activity of imagination uh, than uh, for uh, explicit behavior. So um, um, I think there's something given uh, given easily for granted in this course. Uh, if we talk about uh, an uh, epistemology of uh, understanding, I think imagination is, uh, uh, is a term. Mm? Uh, but uh, with other kind of epistemic, uh, uh, epistemic uh, condition like belief, uh, I think it is uh, sufficient uh, to be in a, uh, at the level of uh, uh, epistemology of knowledge, not of understanding. I use, for example, the notion of a product concept of um, Dunnett no? uh, to, 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 to try to understand why uh, children, when uh, they pretend, uh, they try to, uh, to go against reality and they are, I think they, they are uh, conscious uh, of this, uh, but the reality offer them only props Props um, uh, to, to to go to go to go over uh, reality. Um, so, um, well, I think uh, um, the notion of uh, uh, self-awareness uh, uh, has to be. Uh, uh, when, when you talk about imagination at the two uh, three years or, uh, with two three years old children, I think. Uh, they are uh, developing a uh, concept at a basic level. Uh, the, the kind of level I think is necessary to improve with the inductive uh, generalization, uh, normative knowledge about uh, nature, about uh, the reality. No? And uh, the risk, I think, if I can, uh, is to uh, to reduce self-awareness to an epistemic ability because um, the self uh, is, is transformed in an object. No? Why, for example, for example, why I use observation to, to for, uh, as a common uh, topic be uh, between uh, awareness, uh, as you understand it, and uh, pretense? Because in observation, there is the risk to uh, consider the self as a, a possible object of observation, no? as an object. So uh, it's important for me to discriminate between uh, an, uh, an epistemology of understanding with pretense and an epistemology of uh, knowledge uh, with epistemic uh, ability as belief, uh, etc. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, I'm tired. So thanks again, Thank Piano.